One face is this, my sins are forgiven forever, past, present, and future. But on the other hand, the sins of all men are forgiven past, present, and future. One face is, Jesus loves me, but Jesus loves everybody. The other face of Calvary's work is this. I love Jesus. My sins have not only been forgiven me, that's a part of it. Righteousness has been imputed to me. And something has happened in my heart as surely and certainly as something happened in the heart of Adam. As surely and certainly in reverse as something happened in the heart of Satan. In one moment of historical time, this evil man became good in the sight of God. This unrighteous man became righteous. This impure man became pure. This imperfect man became perfect. This ugly man became beautiful. And this condemned man passed from death unto life. Is that a fact? In one historical moment, as surely as that conversion, that transaction that took place in the heart of Eden and in the heart of eternity in Satan, the reverse of that thing took place in my heart. <clears throat> and from being hateful and hostile towards God, I loved him. And he and I became friends. And he became my father. And I became his son. And suddenly, instantly, my heart was purified by faith. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And do you know that the religious world sits around and reads that same text? And they say, well, have you had any impure thoughts this week? You will never see God. I've had a million impure thoughts this week, at least. But my heart has been purified forever through faith. Isn't that wonderful? Now, brother, you want to judge this message whether it came from God or Satan? Whether it's good or evil? Here's the test. Is it good news to the sinner? <laughs> Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute iniquity. Blessed is the man whose sins are covered. <laughs> Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven him. Blessed is the man whose conscience has been purged in the sight of God by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. Blessed is the man who's been made right with God, not because of the way he walks, talks, or thinks, but made right with God because of his heart being right with God through Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man of whom the writer of Hebrews writes, who can walk right into the presence of God with the full assurance of faith, having a true heart purged and his own body sprinkled and washed with pure water. 
Now, maybe this explains some verses which have been difficult for you. Number one, Paul says to the pure, all things are pure. Explain that to me, theologians. To the pure, all things are pure. Now, the converse of that is true, if that be true. And the converse is simply to the evil, all things are evil. And you know what that means? It means the man with the pure heart can do no evil, and it means that the evil man can do no purity. Maybe it explains why Paul wrote to Timothy when Timothy got all hot and bothered about whether he should eat meat that had been offered to idols and make sacrifice to those demon spirits as other Christians were doing. And Paul wrote to him and he said, Oh, Tim, you and I know that idols are nothing and meat's nothing. And whether you eat the meat or you don't eat the meat, don't make any difference. He said, Tim, you know and I know that everything in God's creation is pure and not to be rejected if it be received with thanksgiving and prayer. For then he says it is sanctified. Who can pray and who can give thanks? No man on God's green earth but those whose hearts have been made right with God. Maybe this is why Paul said to Timothy, there is nothing impure of itself. It has to do with what goes on in the heart, Timothy. Maybe it explains why in Romans 14 he said two men doing the same identical thing, one was wrong and one was right, one was evil and one was good. Yet they were both doing the same identical thing. And he said, the answer to that mystery is this. One did it as unto the Lord, and one did not do it as unto the Lord. And only God knew the difference. Because on the surface, they were both doing the same thing, and they sure did look alike. Maybe it explains John's words when he said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, and does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when he appears, we shall be made like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Maybe it explains that verse, because it doesn't mean that if we sit around and hope for the rapture, we are purifying ourselves day by day by cleaning up our lives and getting ready. Baloney. It means this, every man in whose heart the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, is living and dwelling. He is being purified moment by moment, second by second, in the sight of God even as Jesus Christ is and has been and will forever be pure in the sight of God. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Yeah. It's related to that verse in 1 John. The blood of Jesus Christ perpetually, habitually, continually keeps right on cleansing from all manner of sin. Ye have heard it said, but I say unto you, that every sin that I seem to commit, oh, not simply has been cleansed and purged by Calvary 1900 years ago, I am being moment by moment, second by second, cleansed and purged and purified and holified and sanctified in the sight of God, for he has already glorified me. You may not like it, I ask you again, is it true? For all have sinned and come short 
of the glory of God. That is true. The wages of sin is death. That is true. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that, praise God, is also true. But I have been obedient. And the obedience of faith that I speak of. In God's testimony. The obedience of faith which was his pure gift of grace to me, enabling me to take God at his word, that obedience of faith, my dear brother, did not leave me short of the glory of God. It brought me to the target and glorified me for eternity. And if I am no longer short of the glory of God in the eyes of God, I no longer sin in the eyes of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The converse is true. Those who do not fail of the glory of God do not sin. That's the kind of sinless perfection I believe in. You with me? Sure. And maybe that explains a couple of other verses that, if you bring them together, make some sense right at this point. And one of them is Paul saying in the book of Romans chapter 7, looking at his life through his eyes, judging what he saw by his standards of right and wrong, good and bad, evil, wicked, or righteous and pure, as Paul looked at his own life, appraised his own deeds and his words and his thoughts. He said, I am a paradox. I am a contradiction. There's a part of me that serves the law of sin, but there's a part of me that serves the law of God as accurately, as completely, as totally, and as perfectly as that other part of me serves the law of sin. And he said, I've discovered that both of them are laws that are going to keep right on operating, thank God. One of them is, in my flesh where there dwelleth no good thing, there is a part of me that will continually serve the law of sin, but also there is a part of me that continually serves the law of God. And therefore, when I look upon these things that I serve in the way of sin, I say, It isn't I. It's sin that dwells in me. And maybe if you put together with that the verse from John's epistle when he says, Whosoever is born of God cannot sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Who is God's seed? Is he in you? You cannot sin in the sight of God. That's the sinless perfection I believe in. Send them cards and letters, folks. Keep them coming. (laughs) One more little verse right at this point. That great chapter that the Christian world revels in called the great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. Precious chapter. And in that chapter it says that love thinketh no evil. And if to think no evil is the fruit of true love, there ain't a one of us ever loved anybody because we think evil of ourselves we think evil of each other and we think evil of God but what that verse simply means is that if the heart loves God the heart that has been purified by faith the heart that has been made right with God He doesn't love turning it off and on like you turn the broiler on on your oven. 
You don't love like the weather, hot and cold. You don't love today and hate tomorrow. You love God continually. And you do not do it because you have to or because you're expected to, because you're trying to prove to Him or to others or to yourself that you're right with God. You do it because you are right with God and you cannot help it. And no matter when you ask God questions, no matter when you call Him into reason about the things that He does in your life, no matter when you seem to find fault with what He does and what He says, the heart keeps right on loving. And no matter what you think of your thoughts or your acts or your deeds, you have thought no evil towards God. For love and faith and purity and righteousness and goodness are all the same thing and they are the fruit of the Holy Spirit who indwells me as the Lord Jesus Christ takes up his permanent abode in me and enables he and God his Father to manifest themselves unto me. Now what about hell? Hold on to your seats, Pharisees. I have a statement about that. To hell with it. <laughs> and to hell with everybody that's in it. And to hell with everybody who's going there. I want to read something to you before you condemn me for what I just said. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, listen carefully. These are the words of the angel. Who is the angel here? Why? In verse 9, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, listen to what this angel said to John in the new Jerusalem. As the eternal fate was set before them, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You hear that? Now, let me explain to you for just a moment what that means. And it will answer your questions about whether we will ever feel pity for the unsaved, whether we will ever miss their fellowship, whether God will ever repent and change his mind and feel that they have suffered enough and recall them from that awful place of banishment and bless them, knowing in his heart as we know in ours that they are no worse than us and we are no better than them. Here is the answer. When the unjust die, and when the filthy die, the attitude of the heart is fixed for eternity. They will continue unjust forever. Not because they have not been justified. It is not the state that's in question here. It's the condition of the heart. They will be filthy forever. And let me tell you this, my dear brethren. They will never repent of their filthiness. They will never repent of their unjustness. They will never repent of their hatred for God. They will never repent of their hostility toward God. They will never love righteousness. They will never come to the truth. They will not do any of these things because they do know in their hearts that their deeds are evil and if they come, a discovery will be made. And here is the discovery. It will be discovered that it was not their deeds that were evil, it was them that was evil. It will be discovered that it was not the things they did that was filthy, it was them that was filthy. It will be discovered that it was not sins, it was sin. And 
this is why they will hide in the darkness forever. Glad to. They will not come to the light because their hearts will be discovered. And the Bible says that the tormented are tormented day and night in the presence of what? The Lamb. And I'm told this more than once in the Scriptures, that the torment and the anguish of the damned comes from the eternal presence of the Lamb. The eternal presence of light to those who hate light. The eternal presence of righteousness to those who hate righteousness. The eternal presence of God to those who hate God is hell. Yet the same presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is heaven to me. And I love this righteousness of God. And I love this light of God. I love this Son of God, and I love this God. And that is also an eternal state. Those who are righteous will be righteous forever, and those who are holy will be holy forever. And let's throw this out. We might all be so surprised it will blow our minds when we get in heaven to find out that we are doing things in heaven we did down here and called them evil. <laughs> and to find out in heaven that we do not do the things we did down here that we called good. Now, you know, you could think about that for a while. You know, have a little word picture here. Okay, we all died and went to heaven. Rapture just took place. Wow. Turn the alarm. Oh, hi. Hi, Mike. Hi, Larry. Hi, George. Hi, Lee. Boy, here's a wonderful place. Look what that guy's doing over there. Oh. Oh, man, I'm going to tell God about that. Hey, God, can you see a guy over there? See what he's doing? Yeah, I see what he's doing. What's wrong? Uh, how long have you been here, son? <laughs> well, I just arrived. Well, why don't you for the first million years just shut up? <laughs> and then we'll talk about right and wrong, good and evil, Okay. And then I look around and I look over in hell because we're going to be able to see it. That's been a horrible thought to the religious world. No horrible thought to me this morning. We look over in hell and here are these people in hell who are just hating God 90 miles an hour, who are spitting at the Lamb, who are just boiling over in their filthiness and in their injustice and in their unrighteousness and in their bitterness. And in their awful hatred of the light and of the truth and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet as I look at them over there, I see them doing good things. And I say, hey God, did you notice that these guys are doing lots of good things? He said, I did. I took note of all their wonderful works. But they're all works of iniquity. And they're works of iniquity because I never knew them. And they never knew me, and because they never knew me, and because I never knew them, because they never had a personal relationship to me, and I never had a personal relationship to them, all the good they do is evil. And all the evil that you did, my son, while on the earth, is good. But it has to do with your heart, dear friend, not what you did, said, or thought. Listen carefully. That's 
the discovery the unsaved doesn't want made. And that's the reason why I will never miss you lost people. And that's the reason why I will never feel any pity for you. And that's the reason why I say it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Because if your hatred for Jesus and your hatred for the truth on this earth is also your eternal state, the more you hate him, the less I will miss you for eternity. And the more you hate and despise him throughout the endless days of eternity, the less I will feel sorry for you, the less pity I can ever have for you. You will be forever that demon-possessed man cutting yourself with stones, screaming and crying out, but you will never be like him in that there shall never be a day when you will see Jesus and run to him, feel his touch upon you, feel his robe of righteousness around you, and sit at his feet. Never. If you hate him now, you will hate him forever. If you reject him now, you will reject him forever. If you are actively hostile to him, you will be hostile to him forever. But you say, I'm not hostile to Jesus. Jesus and the truth are the same. Don't ever think you can do some theological magic and put Jesus in one category and the truth in another. Oh, I love Jesus. I just don't believe that doctrine that these people preach. I remind you that Jesus said, if I send somebody and you receive him, you receive me. If I send somebody and he speaks my words and you hear him, You've heard me. But if I send someone and he speaks my words and you reject him and you reject his words, you've rejected me. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel unto the churches to declare these things unto you. Let us hear what the Spirit saith to the church. I'm going to close. You better not, therefore, continue on in a religion that teaches you to imitate the behavior of others. Because if you do, when you get to the bottom line someday, when the God who sees the heart pronounces good, bad, moral, immoral, righteous, evil. It may turn out that the good behavior that you imitated was evil and work of iniquity because of the impurity of your heart. And it may turn out that the conduct and the behavior and the lives of those you did not imitate but condemned and judged, it may turn out that they were right and you were wrong. And is this not what Paul says? Judge nothing until he comes who knows the secret motives of the heart. Let me read something to you. Don't turn because if you get involved in words, you'll miss the message. It's in the second chapter of Romans, verse 17 through 29. Listen carefully. Now I'm going to change the reading of this. Somebody said, that's your trick, you know, when you find something you don't believe, you just change it. <laughs> well, that <clears throat> works out pretty good. <laughs> what I'm going to change in this passage is this. It was addressed specifically to the Jew. But the truth prevails for the professing Christian, for the Jew was the professing Christian of his day. Was he not? Okay, now professing Christian, I want you to listen. And all I'm going to change is I, I'm going to, instead of the letter starting out, Dear Jew, it will say, Dear Professing Christian. Now listen carefully. 
Behold, you who call yourself a professing Christian, and you rest and feel secure and quiet and assured in your law, and you go around boasting about God. And you know His will, and you approve the things that are more excellent, the good things, the righteous things, and you're instructed out of the Bible, and you're confident as you see yourself that you are a guide of the blind and a light to them which are in darkness. Do you hear this, soul winners? You call yourself an instructor of the foolish. Do you hear this, Bible teachers? A teacher of babes. You can't teach anybody anything. Lest the Holy Spirit reveal it. You who have a form of knowledge, you who have the truth of the Bible. I have some questions for you, Paul says. You who teach others, are you ever taught anything? You who preach to the man should not steal, do you steal? Now, wait a minute. Why? I can answer that. I don't steal. Oh, are you sure? Thou shalt not steal is the commandment of God. Religion has changed it, it says. Thou shalt not steal money from my bank. Thou shalt not steal money from thy neighbor's closet. Thou shalt not steal another turkey's car. <laughs> Thou shalt not tote away thy neighbor's TV in the dead of night. Nor shalt thou ransack his garage while he be us on vacation. <laughs> However, thou shalt steal on thy income tax. Thou shalt steal time from thy employer, which is just one step removed from taking money out of his cash register. Thou shalt steal another man's reputation by verbally destroying him in the eyes of others. And thou shalt steal the glory of God continually by glorying in our own works. God says, Thou shalt not steal. Big mouth instructors of others, while thou art saying, God says, Thou shalt not steal. Dost thou steal? Dost thou steal? And thou that sayest a man should not commit a blip. <laughs> okay, we're among friends. Adultery. I have a question. Dost thou commit adultery? Oh, let us go back to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. However, we've revised it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That is, thou shalt not sleep with another woman or another man who is not legally married to you and so duly registered in the Washington County, Wood County Courthouse. However, thou mayest continually give thy flesh to a man or woman legally married to without ever once giving to that person my heart. However, thou canst continue to give to God our works without ever giving to him our heart. Thou that teachest, thou shalt not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? What is adultery? If it is not drawing nigh to God with our lips while our hearts are far from Him. That is adultery. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, that is, thy Bible knowledge, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. 
I tell you what, professing Christian, the name of God is blasphemed through you. For circumcision or baptism or confession of faith or joining the church verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be also a breaker of the law, your circumcision, your baptism, your joining the, crowd, the church and your confession of faith is just the same as though you'd never done any of it. And therefore, if the not doing of it by one man, yet at the same time, he keeps the righteousness of the law. That is, if a man who makes no religious profession, who's never been baptized, never joined the church, never been circumcised, and never said he was a Christian, if that man, in his heart, pure in the sight of God, shall that not be counted for more than your circumcision, your baptism, your joining the church and everything else? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you, who by the letter and circumcision thus transgress the law? Oh, my. You who are so quick to judge others, be careful. They may end up judging you. Now listen to the conclusion. He is not a Christian which is one outwardly, and neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. I'll tell you, Paul says, who is a Christian? A Christian is one who is one inwardly, where the heart has been circumcised in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise may not be of men, but whose praise is of God. Oh, Lord, don't drop any more of them blockbusters down here. You're, you're, you're empty in this hall now, Lord. There ain't going to be nobody here next week but me. Oh, you'll be there fine. I'll be here too, Lord. So let me close my message and quietly and quickly leave by the side door. If the heart is pure, a man can do no wrong in the sight of God. When the heart is not pure, purified by faith, he can do no right in the sight of God. Do you agree to that? A man whose heart is not right with God, every act he commits is adultery. It is theft. It is the blasphemy of his Sabbath. It is the breaking of every commandment and every law that God ever gave to man. If a man's heart is far from him, the service of his lips are works of iniquity, filthy and unjust and evil in the sight of God. And to those whose hearts have been purified by faith, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I don't think that simply refers to the far off future. They see God in everything. They see God everywhere. They see God in eternity. Oh, they see Him in time. They see Him in the forever to come. No, they see Him in the forever now that they're in. Not sitting here licking our wounds hoping for the day to come soon when I can put the glory on but since I have already been risen with Christ and seated in the heavenly places a better exercise than that comes along mm -hmm. occupying myself setting my affections on things above where I am now already glorified and seated with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it behooves me to give you this final warning. And I'm going to call this message, Is Your Heart Right with God? I would advise you to get your heart right with God or all the good works you have done and are doing will go down the tube. And that tube ends up in hell. 
get right with God. Evil is disobedience, the disobedience of unbelief. Good is the obedience of faith. And God says in Hebrews 5, verse 4, that to discern good and evil, a man must know the word of righteousness. I've discerned good and evil, for I know the word of righteousness, and I'll tell you what it is, Jesus. That's the word of righteousness. I'm sorry, there is no book, chapter, and verse religion that will get you to God. There is no law that will get you there. There is no catalog of sin that will keep you straight. No manual for holy living that will be a do-it-yourself guide to heaven. No reference book that will enable you to judge right and wrong in yourself or right and wrong in another. There's just two kinds of people. Those who have the law written on the tables of stone and those who have the law written on the tables of the heart. So you see where that leaves you? It drives you to a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and an abandonment of all of men's schemes to judge yourself right and wrong, good and evil, pure and impure. You're driven to the arms of Jesus. And what a blessed place to be driven. <laughs> oh, religion seems so easy when you can just flip to page 29 and get instructions from God. But, oh, I tell you, without faith, it sure would be hard to talk to a God you can't see and wait on an answer from a Jesus you never hear. But how precious it is when, like we sung this morning, He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You ask me how I know? He lives within my heart. Does He live in yours? The Lord bless you.